Okay, so today I've got a special interview conversation for you guys. We're interviewing Dr. Katie Dimming. Did I say that right, Katie? That's, you just told me. Yeah. That's right. That's she's an right. oncologist and she's been with me for a while. I adore her. One of the things that I like about her is that Katie, I need, I need to talk to you like you're in the room because you're right in front of me, you know, at the computer is, and we'll get there, but there's a lot of places we want to go, is that even though you're in the medical profession and you're an oncologist, there's a part of you wanting to revolutionize the thought processes in the medical field and to get people thinking in, in much, much different ways. We might even go there today. But where I want to go today to start with for people listening is you've been with me in TCP now for what, two rounds, I believe? That's right. Okay, two rounds. And I said, <clears throat> what do you want to talk about today? And I said, well, somebody Manuel talked about fear yesterday, and which is coming out, you know, last week in last week's episode. And you said, well, I, I want, you know, I had a lot of that. And I said, let's do that. And the reason why is so many people are fill in the blank. So many people are blank by fear. What's in that? Paralyzed. Blank? Paralyzed. Okay. So let's go there or however you want your story to unfold. Let's go. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, for me is interesting because I think most people who see me from the outside and in fact, one of my very good friends, who's also an oncologist, I told her one day that I was terrified every day. And she's like, there is no way you are the bravest person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference, right, between being afraid and, and not acting and, and being afraid and still acting. So I was used to acting, even though I was in fear, but fear was something that had been with me since I was a small child. And some of that just came from the environment that I was raised in and that it became kind of my constant companion, being really afraid of failure, afraid of, you know, not being safe, afraid of, you know, not doing the right things. And so I had just gotten used to feeling afraid all the time. I didn't let it stop me. I knew how to act despite the fear and, and keep moving. Um, but it was something that was really holding me back before I came into TCP because I was constantly afraid. And it wasn't until I learned about subconscious reprogramming that I was really able to start to work through that. And, and, and honestly, working, you know, doing subconscious reprogramming hypnosis around the fear was the biggest thing that changed that. But up until September of last year, every single day, all day long, I was afraid. Let's take that apart. You, you've been around me long enough to know that I don't mean to interrupt, but there's so many juicy things that people, they just live it or they, they share it. <clears throat> but there's so many things I can pull out of that. So I want to back up here. There's a lot to unpack here. So your exact words were you were constantly afraid every day. And then you also said you were terrified every day. I was terrified of what? Fill in the blank. I think failure was my biggest fear. Okay. So or or not being accepted, not being good enough. Okay. How does that, any of that play out though going into your profession as a doctor? Well, I think it's interesting because most people would think, well, how could a doctor who's doing this, and now I've been practicing for 16 years, be afraid? And it wasn't a logical thing, right? right. It's, right. it's something that has just been with me that I was comfortable being afraid. And it sounds weird because you're like, well, <laughs> how can that be comfortable? But it was what right. I knew. And right. so it's, it's really where I lived. And, and so, yeah, it was really my constant companion. So let's, let's break this down practically for people is give me a day. <clears throat> now, most of us aren't oncologists or MDs or doctors or medical field, but give us a day. So you go to work. Are you physically feeling fear when you're walking into work, even though you've done it for 15 years? 
I'm just taking this apart even more. Yeah. So are you like, okay, I've got to go into work. Were you feeling like an anxious fear? Were you feeling like a fear, fear? Um, somebody's well, going to confront me. Go ahead. No. Yeah. So no, that's a good question. So I would say like with my patient care going into patients' rooms, I obviously was not afraid of caring for my patients and taking care of them, but there were th certain aspects that I would constantly have as, as, you know, bringing up fear for me. And one of them was like, if I had to present something at a tumor board, which is a meeting with all the other doctors, I always felt like somehow I didn't know what I was talking about, even though mm -hmm. I had expert. all of this knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm an expert in my field, but I had this just feeling like, oh my gosh, maybe someone's going to figure out that I really don't know what's going on. And it was irrational, but it was there. And then I would say also I'm an um, entrepreneur and in entrepreneurship is where this like totally reared its head because mm -hmm. I really realized, oh my gosh, this is something that is underlying everything that I do. And it, and it showed up, you know, kind of in full force in that realm. But I would say in my everyday life as a doctor, it was less about like what I was doing physically, like the taking care of patients, but it was more like with my colleagues and, you know, with, you know, thinking, gosh, do I know all the studies? Am I up to date on everything? There's so much to know all the time. And, right. I, and I think yeah. I've carried this insecurity. And so I always had this underlying, like, you know, am I smart enough? Do I know enough? Do I, you know, and, and there's always more, right? I'm in a yeah. field where actually almost breeds insecurity around not knowing enough because there's so much to know all the time and so much more to learn. And the thing is this, <clears throat> excuse me for, for uh, clearing my throat, <clears throat> is in your field, advancement is, is progressing so rapidly. There's no way any, unless you're Doogie Hauser if you know who that is. Yeah. Okay. There's no way that any doctor can keep up with the amount of information and research reports and everything else that's being, being poured into the world on a daily basis. Even my former, which I've seen this for a long time coming, my former neurologist who's released me from care. When I, would, I only had, I was supposed to have like an appointment every month. I called him every three, four. I, I've, I've talked to him three times in eight months. And my last call is like, you know, with where you, how well you're doing, I'm, just, I'm releasing you from care. And even when I talked to him on some things early on, like my second call, he was like, well, I don't know the answer to that. He'd grab a book and look it up. And I'm like, wait, shouldn't he know? And then I thought, how can he keep up with everything? You know? So let me ask you this for you, for your sake is tell me one doctor that knows everything about everything in medicine. Nobody. No one. So then how come you were holding yourself or what was causing you to hold yourself to a standard where you had to know everything, but it was okay for other people not to know everything? Yeah, no. And, and, and I think it really was that I was just in the habit of, of yep. being that way. Right. And then also there was an experience that I had early in my career that affected to the way that I felt in medicine. And, um, that experience was when I was interviewing for medical school. I, um, I knew I wanted to be an oncologist coming into medical school because of my experience working at hospice as an undergrad. And um, I had, you know, I interviewed, I think at like six schools and none of the interviews were with an oncologist. And at one school, they put me with an oncologist and I was so excited for this interview that, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to meet with this man and he's going to understand why I want to go into oncology. And um, what happened was, is that he asked me, he, you know, had seen on my personal statement, you want to go into oncology, tell me why. And I told him, I said, you know, the reason why I want to go into oncology is I had this experience volunteering at hospice, taking care of people who are dying and the lessons that I learned in the intimacy of connecting with people who are facing a life-threatening illness. And in particular, I took care of mostly people with cancer at this hospice. It just opened my eyes and changed my life that I want to spend the rest of my life with those people and in that space of having that intimate connection and, um, 
I just want more of that. And he looked at me and he said, that is not a good reason to become an oncologist. If you want to be an oncologist and you want to go through 13 more years of training, you need to love the science. And I remember yeah. in that moment, just like a feeling like I couldn't be who I am. Mm. And I, you know, I left that interview, just tears streaming down my face. And, um, and I walked out of there and I said, I'm not saying that again, you know, I'm going to pretend that I like the science. And I had taken that to mean that I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't good enough. And the place that I was interviewing was Harvard. So clearly I was smart enough because they don't fight yeah. people to interview there, but I didn't know that at the time. And so that was like another piece that layered on top of this. So I went into medicine and I don't love the science. I can do the science. Right. I can do all of it, but it's not why I do what I do. And so I think for years, I felt like somehow I really didn't fit in, you know, and maybe I wasn't good enough. Let me go there for a minute, Katie. There's something here to unpack a bigger picture that people listening, I've spent a year with you now, they have not. What that doctor took away from you as an expert at Harvard, what he took away from you, and this will hit you immediately, and you'll understand. What he took away from you is who you are and why you came to the planet, right? I mean, he, because if I know you today and your passion is not the mechanics of medicine your passion which a lot of doctors are not they're they're tech, they're technicians they're statisticians they can you know decipher information but they're not healers you know and you know that from the level you've worked at so what he did is you've had this because i want to go i want to go many places here but what he did is those of you listening she got emotional because I know her and her whole heart is into this service of humanity and helping people transition over and things we'll dig into some more. And this doctor who, was, who, who she believed was an expert at Harvard took away the essence of her beingness that drove you. Is that accurate, Katie? Yes. Okay, because I know you. So mm -hmm. let's go here because I want to jump around all over here, but I want to kind of keep this cogent. Everyone listening, before Katie and I talked today, she said, where's, I'm making notes all over the place. She goes, something about being, doing what I do as an oncologist, when people, you know, are terminally ill, they, I made a quote here, figure it out. And I'm like, stop right there, because I don't want to know what you're going to say, because I want this live, you and I talking. What's your observation of what people figure out when it's time for them to leave? Yeah. Well, that goes back to my experience of um, volunteering at hospice when I was 20 years old. And, you know, what I saw there was that people who are dying, not all of them, but some people when they're dying, they figure it out. Mm -hmm. They figure out what this lifetime is about and that they, despite what pain, physical pain they're in or emotional pain or, you know, the kind of fear of ending this life, they figure out how to be happy, mm. how to be fulfilled in the moment. And that like really just drew me in because I was like, I want that. And I knew that that was possible because I had seen it. And then, you know, throughout my career, I've been searching for that, you know, and, and I for know yourself, right because for myself so here. So pardon me for interjecting there, but your whole theme when we started was fear. And then you were seeing these people that were transitioning and they weren't having that. And then right. you probably were thinking, I want the peace and the joy that they have. How do they get that without leaving them, you know, leaving the planet. Right. That's okay, right. So when you said that's what you wanted, that's what you wanted. 
That's right. right. I wanted that peace, that happiness, that fulfillment, regardless of what was happening in my external life. And I knew that it was possible. And then I've seen it now. I've been practicing for 16 years and I know that it's possible for people who are facing cancer, you know, or the end of their life to figure it out. And what I didn't know was, could you do that short of having a terminal illness? And really for TCP, you know, I didn't know anything about TCP, but I got an email about your money, the money masterclass, Mm -hmm. and I signed up for it. And as soon as you said TCP, I knew in a second I had to do it. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how much it cost. I didn't know how long it was going to be. I I just knew intuitively that I had to be in there. And honestly, um, TCP is the secret. Like it is the formula for how you do what I had seen so many patients do. Mm. And, And it's a way of walking people through that transformation to figure out how do I be happy, be fulfilled, be content exactly as everything is right this minute. And Mm. that's what TCP taught me. And, you know, it's like I now realize after going through this that I was searching you know, I was trying to achieve my way to happiness. Like I thought if I just did the next thing, if I just got the next, whatever it is, title or award. I guess they would be title for you, professional recognition. I'm good at what I do. Is that what it is? Patent. You know, I have invention. So it's my next patent. It's my next business. It's my next, you know, I've led large scale health systems. I've designed and launched cancer service lines for the largest healthcare company in the United States. So I've done big things. And so I just was like, okay, what's the next thing? Thinking that if I achieved, I would get to this point. But what I realize is that if you don't figure out right this minute, how to be content, fulfilled, happy in this moment, when you get those things, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to find that. The way to find it is to find it in this moment right now. And then actually all of that other stuff starts rushing in and it's so much easier. I was pushing my way to success, just like forcing through sheer will and discipline. So, Which is hard, by the way, and exhausting and tiring because we're always doing something or always putting on a show to please other people, because when they do that, oh, I'm going to get my next step up again, because I'm impressing everybody around me, and someone's going to notice, and when they don't notice, I will try harder and run myself into the ground, and all the things that I'm seeking, which are happiness ultimately, I'm actually running away from by doing this. Exactly. Exactly. Let's go here for a moment. This is some... Wow. This is, you know, when people come into TCP, the Transformational Coaching Program, I don't know if you remember, but the first week I all are thereabouts. I always say, guys, all of you, I want just one thing for you. I want you to find peace. That's it. Because see, when you find peace, all the money you're chasing and all the cars and the homes and the title, those things come pretty easily when you find the peace, but we're so consumed in this world with doing what you were doing, the awards and the, and especially in your field, the, the more prestigious the award, the more powerful it is for you. I mean, Harvard, come on, where are you going to get better than that? Right. And that's better than community college in Podunk USA. So we're taught in this world to go do all these things to be unfulfilled, to be fulfilled. And then we're unfulfilled. But let's go a couple of places here. You had said that at the end of the life, they figure out that just, I'm, in, I'm leaving the planet. Just be happy now. How, uh, how did that happen for you with me? Because I'd kind of like something practical for people that are listeners. 
how did that happen for you? Because you had knowledge of it. You had awareness, you had observation, and that's where you wanted to go. And you came with me and we got practical for, you know, two sessions now, 14 weeks each. If you can, what were kind of the things you did with what I gave you and the coaching to make that happen for you? I think one thing is the foundation is self-worth, you know, really working on self-love, self-worth. That was my focus for actually both rounds of TCP. I focused on self-love, but I think self-love and self-worth is foundational. And it was something that was severely lacking for me. Mm. Um, and so that was, you know, started with, with really that. But I remember the day that it clicked for me where things started to open in TCP and it was the week on choice. Yeah. And I was in clinic and by the way, did I lead that week? I normally, this next TCP, I'm leading all the weeks and that's really a week that I loved or did somebody else lead that? I can't remember. Okay. I I normally lead. That's my, it's one of my favorite weeks because you hear me say, what so many people say, well, that is a choice. What I say is life, life is choice. is choice because your entire life from second to second is choice and whatever choice you make creates an outcome okay let's go back to you this is juicy so that yeah. was the week that it clicked Take a yeah so i was in clinic and i will say that medicine has um victim mentality mm-hmm. everywhere yeah. We keep our patients in victimhood. We are in victimhood as physicians, the staff, you know, feeling really out of control. Hang with- on, Katie, please. I, I have to interrupt here. So people understanding, we all understand when you say medicine keeps people in victim mentality, what is your definition and how are you defining victim mentality? So everyone listening will be able to get their teeth into that. Yeah. So I think of it as people not having sovereignty over their yeah. lives and ability to make choices that they're trapped in this situation. Like for our patients, they're trapped in their illness and this is happening to them. And mm-hmm. with physicians, you know, people who are burnt out working in medicine, it's like, it just, you feel like you're being just piled on and piled on and there's more work than you can do. And really you have no control over it. Okay. And feeling just stuck um, in, in kind of like a victim um, in that scenario. Does that? Now let's add here though also, you see this every day and you know that I have a lot of, well, you've seen several, they're all Harvard people and et cetera and some, and not everybody in TCP is Harvard, obviously, but you see a lot of people in that profession that are doctors that are trapped in their own profession because mm-hmm. they become victims of, okay, Uh, which I did did a podcast recently on money, you know, making money your master. So they go to medical school. They have all these bills. They go in their profession, which is not a healing profession. It's a business. Then they get in it. They they buy the houses and the cars and the kids in school. And then what happens? They're trapped in their life. And then they don't like their life and they can't get out of it. And they become victims to, well, this is the way my life is set up and organized. And even though I hate going to the hospital every day, I have to do it. So I just wanted to share that as an afterthought for people listening, that your industry is full of people who live from victim mentality. And victim mentality, as I share with you guys in TCP and here, is it's not my fault. I didn't cause this. I'm stuck. There's nothing I can do about this. It just is the way that it is. And I will deal with it and accept it. And it doesn't mean not accepting but it means literally just blindly taking things from people and not recognizing, as you said, Katie, I have power. I am power. I can choose. And then you pick up from there. That was a big week choice. I can choose. Yeah. So I was in clinic that day after we had had, you know, the homework on choice. And I think we had had responsibility before choice. And so I had that concept in my head as well. And I was in clinic. I was like triple booked. It was crazy day. I was just running from one place to the next. And I remember I was back at the CT scanner and I somehow a result for one of my patients had popped up and I saw that she had 
widely spread metastatic disease that was new. And the patient was here, actually, she was having a scan for something else. But I knew that if she left, the other doctor who ordered the scan was going to call her on the phone and just like do a drive by, hey, you've got widely metastatic disease. And even though I had no time in my schedule, I stopped and I was like, okay, number one, I've chosen this career. I'm responsible for the position that I'm in right now, you know, and, and I get to choose how I show up, even though it felt, you know, it feels out of control and like, you don't have control of your schedule. So I was like, I told my nurse, I said, I want you to put her in a room. And I was like running between patients. And I had a patient who was like a gynecologic cancer where I knew I was going to have to have her get undressed to do an exam. So I said, you put her in a room when I have five minutes while that patient's getting undressed, I'm going to go in and I'm going to sit face to face and I'm going to tell her the news myself. And it was like, I'm choosing to do that because that's the doctor that I want to be. So it just like hit and so funny, like, I don't want to cry, but I'm, this is who I am. And you know that okay. I'm really sensitive and I feel so much. And I used to be ashamed of that, mm. but I'm not because I know that's what makes me really good at my job. So anyway, I had five minutes, ran out, sat with my patient across face to face. And I told her and I was able to give her the news and she knows me. She trusts me. And even though we had such a short amount of time, it was my choice to do that. And then it, th it just happened to be that that day I had another patient who had brain mets and same thing. Normally I would have just been like, oh, just pick up the phone, find a time and just get her on the phone and, and I'll call her and tell her. And who knows if she's driving in traffic or she's got her kids in the car, but this is like our days, right? Like yeah. I'm just trying to fit it in. And I was like, nope, I'm going to choose to do that different. So I called my front desk and I said, you know, call this patient, schedule a video visit at this time. And it was like, again, like a little five minute break, but, and tell her, you know, that I want to have a conversation with her. So then it preps her that the doctor wants to talk to her and she's not driving or, you know, the with kids, her kids right, like or whatever. And so I was able to tell her and she had her husband with her. And it's like, these seem, probably seem like little things, but this is in medicine. We don't have the luxury of doing everything, you know, um, with these like nice time scales. And so for me that day, I was like, I am in control. And I do get to choose how I do this job. So for me, it just like clicked on that day. And then it's just become for me, it's like everything is choice. How I show up in every minute is my choice. Mm -hmm. And through TCP, I show up really differently in every minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm listening and I'm absorbing. Do you know that when you actually, you know this, and this is why you got emotional partly, is that do you know when the first case you had mentioned and what you probably told her was not the best thing and the best news that anybody would want to hear that day, period, or, or you know, and you were caring and you were compassionate. You, you showed humanity when you talked to her. But I made a big note here and I circled, I squared it. You were in true service as a healer. And what I've noticed with you explaining things is, and over time is when you're, you often hear me talking about in TCP is don't waste your life. Don't mark time. You know, you're just, you're, you're living your entire life just going for your days and you're wasting your life. And I often say, whatever it is, live your dharma. And for you, that's what you say. I would say you're living your dharma. You're living why you came to the planet. So while you're here, you're demonstrating it. 
and you're impacting people daily. And it might be that five minutes for you, but guess what? It's months or weeks or days people hear that doctor's voice in their head and it came from somebody who cared. And I talked yesterday in about Money Live about Virginia Cook, love, care, concern, and giving. How much, I don't know where I want to go here with this. How important do you think it is to care and love the people you're working with? It's everything. And do you think it's made a difference in your career as an MD, as a doctor, as an oncologist? For sure. Okay. Where to go from there? Because you've said some things like, wow, this is a really good, this is a really good episode. I made some notes over here. We should have a call on show. People can call in and ask, you know, okay, how, you know, all these questions. Okay. Let's go back to what, what kind of epiphanies when people you said figured it out, can you share anything with us about your observation about how they got the happy? Well, I think the first thing is gratitude. The people suddenly have a true appreciation for this life, this body, this experience, the relationships. It just becomes so clear what we take for granted every day, mm. you know, when yeah. you become sick. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I see people who get it are it's appreciation. Yeah. When I had uh, the big C recently and I'd messaged you, you know, you know, MD, I wasn't asking mm -hmm. you for medical. I was just talking about something. I don't know what it was. And we laughed about it, but I, you know, I had, you've been with me. I had um, heart failure last year, which according to the cardiologist, I'm completely healed from. I'm supposed to be sick for a lifetime is what doctors told me. I'm not sick for a life. I have a stronger heart than most people now, but the doctor said, this is a lifetime condition and all this. No. And then I had a hemorrhagic stroke. And I talked to my neurologist yesterday and it's interesting. He goes, you had a really weird stroke. He goes, we don't see that that much because it's very rare and it wasn't major. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, people don't realize and 30, I think one third of Americans die from strokes. The numbers are crazy or it's a large amount. They die of strokes, it's crazy. And our system, like my doctors, all the doctors tried to keep me in fear all the time. They tried to make me a victim to their beliefs and what they thought about what the medical books and medical research said. And I think that's all very valuable. You need trauma doctor, you, whatever, oncologist, go, you need that. But do not let the system victim, you know, victim, victimatize you. Is that the right word? Victim victimize. Victimize. Vic okay, victimize. I pulled the George Bush on that one. But victimize you. Okay, it's been a long day. I mean, I've done things all day long, so my brain's a little tired. But is there anything else that you want to share about your path? Because this is the big, Katie, so many people, they're just not happy. Let me ask you this. Let's go here. Can I say one thing yeah, about yeah, what absolutely. you just said? So what you just said ties into, you know, when I had said, what do people who are facing the end of their life figure out? Like appreciation is what you makes you really choose to enjoy this life, this moment, exactly as it is. But what you just described is another aspect, which is around healing. And like true healing is really about believing what's possible and that our bodies are miraculous, you know, and medicine, we're taught these confines, like what is not possible, you know, to put things in containers so that you can dice and splice and, and, you know, categorize things. But true healing is so expansive that it doesn't fit in medicine. And so what you're describing is that oftentimes in medicine, we don't know what to do with that, right? But that is something that I see in patients who, you know, I have patients who defy the statistics. And I used to wonder, I was like, is it just because they have a positive attitude? And it's like, no, it's because they believe it's possible. And like, they really believe that, like deep down, which I think 
is hard to do in the system that we've created. We really, like you said, we, and I actually, since I've been in TCP, I think about, we have to do informed consent, which is when we're gonna do treatment on a patient, we have to tell them everything possible that could go wrong. And I now, when I do that, I'm like, I wish I could do this and then just like erase it from their mind. Yeah. No, <laughs> because hey, basic- Let's talk here, let's, let's talk. This is huge for everyone listening. When I was in the hospital with the cardiologist, one of the cardiologists said, this could be a lifetime condition. You might have 35% use, percent use of your heart. All these negative things. That's my informed consent, so to speak, you know? And I'm like, you're killing people. You know, you mean to do well, but you're, kill you're killing people with your authority status and the power of words. And I'll tell you the truth. What I said mentally was, is I said to myself, to the doctor, you can take your diagnosis and stuff it up your ass because I'm not gonna live by, that's not how I'm going to live. And look at me today, but I'm supposed to be sick. This is where I'd like you to finish out and keep on going with what you're saying, but tie this into it also, one question. This will affect a lot, this will affect 50% of people listening or someone in their family. Let's say that someone, them or someone in their family, you just have the floor once I ask this question, it's yours. And I want you to show up as I know you want to show up, okay, that you're comfortable with, with, with your answer. The question is this, and we can apply this to all areas of our life also, but let's take health. Somebody's diagnosed with, you're sick, you're, you know, cancer or this or that or this or that or this or that. What would you advise now being a highly recognized MD all these years of experience and then knowing what you know now with healing, forget the medical establishment as best you can. What would you recommend anybody hearing any kind of news like that? You're their doctor, but you get to be any kind of doctor you want to be to heal them. Talk to them. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I said to a patient today. So I saw a patient and she has breast cancer she's got to go through the treatment. And I told her, I said, we're going to do our part and we're going to treat the, you know, symptoms that you have. I said, but your part is to do the deeper healing. And then that's truly where your healing begins and ends. Like the stuff that we do to you is not healing you. It's kind of fixing and patching up. And I recommended a couple things for her. I told her, and, and now I recommend this almost to every patient if they're open to it, because not everyone who comes to see a Western doctor wants to hear all this, right? But if yeah. I, I know they're open, so I recommend love yourself like your life depends upon it. Mm. It's like, this is, the best place that you can start. And I recommend that and in working on self-love and self-compassion, really taking good care of yourself. And I said, you know, illness is an opportunity, right? There's opportunity in crisis because when your role blows up because you have an illness in my world, because you have cancer, it's an opportunity to stop and to reevaluate what is it that you want in this life and what's not working? So self-love, self-worth, it's foundational. This patient, I also talked to her about subconscious reprogramming. And I said, you know, what you've learned between ages zero and seven, it's programmed into your mind. And no matter what you do in terms of your thoughts, if those things that have programmed, been programmed underlying are you know, repeating a loop that is unhelpful for your emotional, mental, physical well-being, you can do thought work all day long and kind of do all the things and, and not make progress. So I recommend hypnosis. Um, for anyone with cancer, Bruce Lipton's books are great. And it really describes and explains this mm -hmm. whole concept of subconscious on um, cancer specifically. Um, and then, you know, Anita Morjani's book, I love it. Totally. You know, yeah, she is just incredible. And I think it's such, I recommended her book to a woman that I saw last week who has metastatic breast cancer. And she's an example of, you know, she was dying of lymphoma. She had, you know, golf or uh, tennis ball sized tumors yeah. coming out of her neck and, and 
the, mo- Basically, the, the, book, guide, the book, Anita Mugliani's book, she's the one who was dying of lymphoma. So let's exactly. See. Yeah. Anita Murjani, uh, Dying to Be Me is the book. And but it's such a good example of where she was dying. She actually died and then came back. But as she came back, she believed it was possible. And all of those tumors just went away, like dissolved. And doctors and they're- were shocked. Many medical science evidence was shocked that somebody could be dead and come back and the body heals. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens when we what, Katie? We believe. But we, we love ourselves. Oh, we'll love ourselves. Yeah. And believe it's love. Yeah. Everything is love. Let's go. I'm just flabbergasted. Let's go here. And this will tie into whatever. And it's yours to wrap up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to, to wrap us up. But a question for you. Don Javier has told me before that when people get diagnosed of something, the first thing they do is go into fear. Oh, my God. I have cancer, I have this, I have prostate cancer, I have breast cancer, I've got a ruptured this, what, whatever. The first thing they do is go into fear. And he goes, that's the worst possible place that people can go. Now, everyone listening, Doc here is nodding her head. She's like, yeah, okay. So I've learned, like when I had heart failure and I had a stroke, I, I didn't go into fear. I mean, the, the, the doctor, the ER doctor was not bedside manner. He's like, you have heart failure. I'm like, maybe there's a better way to deliver that. But I was like, okay, you know, because I knew it wasn't going to be, I was going to leave the planet. It's not permanent. I don't, it's not permanent. But most people go into fear. Now, where should they go instead? So this is, this is something I didn't teach this particular patient because she wasn't in fear, but this is something that I teach my patients. So most are though. Most, oh no, I would say 99% of my patients are just paralyzed by fear. Your um, job scares people. Oncologist, oh my God, that's bad. Yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. so after my first round of TCP, I saw a documentary called Buck. And it's about Buck is a horse whisperer. Mm-hmm. The, the movie, The Horse Whisperer with Robert Redford was based on Buck. Mm-hmm. And Buck said something in that film where Buck had been abused as a child and his father was very abusive and he had been taken out of his home and put into a foster family's home. And when he went to the foster family, the dad gave him a hammer and set him out to a fence and said, go work on the fence. And Buck said, that was so what I needed in the moment was to go and do a job. And as he grew up, he grew up on this, the family that took him in were horse ranch. Uh, they took care of horses. And, um, and he said, I realized people want to break horses. They want to beat them into submission to get them to perform. But he said, I realized early on that those horses were just like me when I was a little boy. And he said, they just need to be loved. A horse needs to be loved and they need a job to do. And in that moment, it clicked for me because I was really struggling with my own thoughts and my own brain. And I was like, that's how you can help your patients manage their brain and their fear is that I teach them. I said, I want you to become like a brain whisperer. Your brain is designed to scan for danger. Mm -hmm. So the fact that your brain right now is pointing out all the things that you should be afraid of, that you could die, that you could lose your family, that you're gonna be in pain, all these things, I want you to thank your brain. Your brain is doing a great job. Love your brain, thank it, and then give it a job to do. And the job is your intent. Where do you want to go? You want to be in perfect health and you want to imagine that. But this for me has been a wonderful way to help my patients with fear because it's not beating down those thoughts. Like you shouldn't be afraid. It's like, no, nothing's gone wrong. Our reptilian brain is designed to scan for danger. And so helping them realize that, love their brain, thank it for doing its job, and then bring it where you want it to go, give it a job. So for me, that's how I help my patients manage fear. Yeah, and so many people, as I said, they go right into fear when they hear, when they even have to go to an oncologist's office to go into fear. But people listening, 
you can apply this to fear in all the areas of your life because every one of you listening and like you know katie said here your reptilian brain its job is to scan your environment unconsciously 24 7 for danger it's a survival mechanism amongst other things so your whole life is wired around fear so we live our lives like you did through fear and when people recognize that the opposite of fear is love mm -hmm. and you want to be very direct and i think when people you know people think well, you know i'm not the flowery you know gandhi kind of person but i tell you i've learned over the years the number one place that you can live from and you have to get out of your ego and your self-importance and all that the most powerful place you can live from is love yourself and accept and love other people and when people come to you i'm going to step out here you probably can't professionally but i'm going to step out and say the reason that people get sick like anita said about herself is because they don't love themselves and they beat themselves up and they hate themselves. And they spend, like she said in her book, so many, so many years of fear. And when I got sick, it was a bit of an anomaly in that I don't, I mean, doctors are like, you're a unicorn, whatever that means in medicine, like you should never be here. You're healthy, blood work, everything's healthy. For me, what happened to me happened so that I could grow because I could never talk about healing as in like kind of a quasi expert until I went through a stroke and heart failure, which basically qualifies me as somebody who knows about healing. I couldn't do that without these experiences. I'm telling all of you guys and a doc, a doctor, okay, you guys a real MD right now. And a very credible one is telling you the worst place you can go in healing and in life. And she can demonstrate that with her own life is fear. Final question. What's one thing you want to leave with them? You've left a lot. I don't even know if there is one. I mean, what's something you want to leave with them? Yeah, I think that one thing that is really important in this work and self-growth and through TCP is like, we think that the goal is to be comfortable, to like be happy and fulfilled. And, and you have to learn how to be happy and fulfilled regardless of what's going on. Yeah. But with this work to really make the transformation, you have to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable mm -hmm. and really living on that razor's edge of like pushing yourself because as you're growing and you're stretching, each time you stretch and push outside what you've been you know, accustomed to doing, you feel like, oh no, something's gone wrong. Everything's wrong, I feel horrible. But it's like, no, this is, the growth. So for me, part of the my commitment to myself in doing this work is being really comfortable with being uncomfortable in the growth and knowing that that's part of the process. So I'm going to challenge you to be, which I've watched you grow a lot in our time together. So maybe a thought for you to be uncomfortable is to take what take this interview, and I'm just kidding, but share it with the entire medical profession so that they wake up so that we heal the world as opposed to it being a business that actually helps people stay unwell absolutely katie wow thank you so so i, I didn't know what we we're going to talk about today and i was like i'm calling my team like what what you know what's our theme today but i've known you for a while I'm like i'll just hop on and see where it goes i you know manuel knocked it out of the park in his call last week on fear and you, from your perspective, knocked it out of the park as well. And, there, you know, I know that you've listened to the podcast and you know me, but you helped a lot of people, a lot of people with your words. So all I can say is, is thank you so, so much. I'm grateful. Oh, thank you, Jim. I'm so grateful. I love you. I adore you. I love you too.